Robbie Williams Rewind. Welcome to Robbie Williams Rewind. We are the champions. I'm Matt. And I'm Lucy. And along with help from special guest fans, we take you on an in-depth rewind through the solo career of multi-award winning singer, songwriter and entertainer Robbie Williams. Today, we are delighted to welcome Robbie's Australian friends, co-writers and Lufthouse bandmates, Tim Metcalf and Flynn Francis. Welcome to the show, guys. Great to be hey, here. Guys. <laughs> Thanks for coming on. So if you've seen Rob on tour in the past year, it's likely that you saw Tim and Flynn support him as Lufthouse, playing the EDM songs they've written with Rob. Prior to Lufthouse, Tim and Flynn wrote the Take the Crown album with Rob, lots of under-the-radar tracks, plus many more songs on The Christmas Present. Yeah, and honestly, some of our all-time favourite Robbie songs were written with you both, like Gospel, Raver... Into the Silence, Heavy Entertainment Show, Be a Boy, Motherfucker, the list goes on. Yeah. <laughs> We're absolutely <laughs> thrilled coming, to have coming. you. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we love our fans, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, we're not just saying that, honestly. honestly. You know, we, we really do love those tracks. Um, yeah, and yeah, we'll, we'll, talk about, we'll talk about some times when we heard them actually uh, as we go through the interview. But yeah, we're thrilled to have you on the show. So thank you. So uh, in typical Rewind fashion, let's rewind back to the beginning. So I believe mm. you met at school. How old were you? Flynn and I, we, we were 12, Flynn, 12, 13, year seven. Yeah. First year of high school. Right. Yeah, wow. It really is taking us back. I didn't know we were going this far. <laughs> Five years ago. <laughs> it's all right. It's not therapy. Don't worry. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> so Tim, and uh, I, yeah, we, Tim, and I, Tim and I met in the music school, actually. We did, didn't we, Tim? Um, we, yeah. we met in the music school. We didn't school. do music, right? No, we, did. we didn't. But we met in the music school. And um, we quickly struck up a, a friendship and became, yeah, really good friends straight away. And then, yeah, we obviously continued our friendship and then we formed this musical bond and we've been working together for a really long time. So, Yeah, we played a lot of bands together and stuff like through the later teenage years. Early 20s. And then, uh, yeah, early 20s. Yeah. Can you remember any of your band names? (laughs) Undercolors. I knew Undercolors. <laughs> Any others? Um, no, <laughs> yeah, Undercolors was the name of the group that we were playing together in, um, and that yeah, we we kind of played a lot of that music to Rob. I mean, I'm skipping ahead here, so yeah. to um, because we had yeah, as Tim said, we were playing live as a band, and then we had a lot of material, a lot of songs, um that Rob really liked too. So, um, and some of those songs are still kicking around today. And some of those songs are also to, to be released at a certain Uh point. Excellent. Cool. So what were your musical influences growing up? Did you have like the same music? Not really growing up, did we Flynn? No. We like the same stuff now. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I I was kind of um uh I was really into like Blink One Eight Two, like that pop the pop punk emo like rock, you yeah. know that kind of stuff. And Flynn, I liked a lot of classic rock, mm-hmm. so like the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, um, and then Tim you and too. I, U two, um, Fleetwood Mac. And then, but Tim and I did, we we always used to see bands that would come to town, like the Killers, the Arctic Monkeys, um, the Strokes, uh, Kings of Leon, like a lot of those bands that were happening and having a moment when we were younger, we would always go together to these shows. And then a lot of Australian bands like um, Silverchair, um, 
Grinspoon. Who else was there, Tim? From a, there's, a, there's pretty fertile Australian music at that time too, right? Yeah. Good, wasn't it? Yeah. 28 Days. Yeah. Um, there was a lot of Australian bands that were having a big moment, but it was more rock. It was more like rock music, right? Right. We grew up on rock music. We grew up on guitar music. We grew up playing guitar um, and then writing, you know, band tracks. And that was our jam. So mm -hmm. yeah, for me, it was like the classic stuff. Tim obviously loved the pop punk stuff, but then we'd, we'd go and see those bands, Foo Fighters, you know, who were having the, the big moments. We, we were teenagers or in our early twenties when these bands were having their yeah. Oasis, Chili Peppers. We saw Oasis, it all. Yeah. yeah. In fact, we, we used to line up like we sometimes, I know we see a lot of, um, People lining up for Robbie shows, and when we like walk in, and we're just you know. But we we we, we used to do that for you too when we were oh. like 15, 16. Like so, so you yeah. We 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 spent a, yeah. We we're really into it. We loved it. <laughs> so you you've like, been you've been at the barrier, have you? I think. I mean, this I don't is, know if we ever got to the barrier. <laughs> this is the first time I think we've said this, but I think we actually lined up for the Close Encounters tour. Oh. Uh -huh. I think we were actually we lined up for that one. You did um, actually? What year would that have been? Two thousand and six. Yeah. Okay. See, we would have been like eighteen. <laughs> right. Ten. <laughs> ten. You were wow. ten, yeah. <laughs> I was ten. Tim was eighteen. Um, no free tickets back then. Yeah. No, <laughs> no guest list, Sven. Yeah. <laughs> I love the fact that you guys understand the craziness of queuing, though. That's yeah. that's. Yeah, brilliant. Oh, no, make no mistake, we haven't queued for anything for a very long time. Oh, no, I appreciate sure. that. Like, <laughs> like, this is when we were young children. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Always on the guest list, right? Did your families encourage you when you were developing your musical career in the early days or were they, were they, you know, not sure? How, how did that go? Oh, I think our families were very encouraging. We were very yeah. lucky. Yeah, very, very supportive. Yeah. yeah. From like driving us, I mean, my dad and Tim's dad like definitely were driving us to shows, picking up gear, like buying us instruments. We were very lucky to have supportive. Yeah, I used, I used, I used um, to drive across the city every Sunday to have band practice when I was – from probably 12 to 17. Right. <laughs> so yeah, right. they were very encouraging. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Great. And you went to LA to get your first break rather than staying in Australia. Um, what made you decide to try over there, uh, over anywhere else, like London or, or staying there? At that point, like in our early 20s, we kind of started focusing on writing pop, pop music as well as doing our band and all that other stuff. But that industry was kind of there and it was kind of the epicenter of the, um, you know, pop pop music industry and, and the music industry. Um, and so we were like, you know, we got to be there if we, got, if we want to make something yeah. happen. And it was, I mean, it was just by coincidence that Rob lived in LA. It was, um, there was no, you know, but um, that, that that's what kind of got us there in the first place, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Right. And you managed to get what, like work experience in some studios or something? We did a couple of internships. I did a couple of internships, like in the valley. I think Flynn did did one as well, right? <clears throat> we were um trying to trying to pay our dues for sure, meet yeah. whoever we could, you know, yeah. just just do the classic, you know, thing. Yeah. So making the connections, meeting the right people, mm -hmm. right place, right time. Yeah. Cool. Well, trying to. <laughs> <laughs> our first job was Robbie, so. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So then while you were there, you were obviously playing as Undercolours and then somehow you met Dylan, Rob's brother-in-law. So yeah. how did that come about? Was it literally just in a bar? When? Um, well, this is going back. We we actually, I don't want to get like, because it's a long, it's a long story. It's a cloudy time. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, met, we met a great bunch of people, um, the, these great Americans, um, some who we're still friends with, like Lindsay and Jane, um, on New Year's Day. And then they introduced us to a friend who in turn introduced us to Dylan. 
Right. I went to college with Dylan at Boulder. Um, and at the time, I actually hadn't met Dylan. Tim, Tim had met Dylan uh, and his friend Dave uh, on one of the Los Angeles trips. And then I remember Tim telling me he'd return back to Melbourne because we were kind of at the time going on and off between Melbourne and L.A. Um, he'd met these great guys. Um, and then we struck up a friendship with Dylan and Dave. And then um, Dylan, you know, obviously mentioned that his brother-in-law is Robbie. Mm-hmm. And then um, Dylan had a band called The Connects, which is like a rap a rap group. Yeah. And then he kind of encouraged Tim and myself to make a song for The Connects. And then Dylan ended up playing the song that we made very off the cuff to Robbie. And then Robbie, we met Robbie on email first, actually. Mm. Uh, and this is kind of the definitive story. Um, we met him on email and then he started to sing over some tracks that two tracks that Tim and I did. Um, one was, I think the early bones of Raver, I believe. Ah. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah was, right. I'm not sorry. Wow. Yeah, wow. You're much better at this than I am. Archivist. <laughs> and then, <laughs> memory he, Tim and I said, um, I know Chris Briggs had a version, right? He did. Yeah. Tr- there's a lot of truth in that. Yes, that he did. Happened. That We'd happened. love to hear your side, actually, yeah, Flynn. Yeah, that happened. <laughs> that was kind of like mixed in with what really happened, right? Okay. <laughs> then Tim and I went back to Los Angeles and we meant to, to go to meet Robbie for the first time and we, we knocked at the door and his security guard opened the door and then um, we, we went and we met Rob and then we went up to his studio and we began playing music and then um, I think he invited us pretty quickly thereafter to like stay with him for a bit. Um, and then we had this really, really fertile time where we wrote the majority of Take the Crown and we were just playing music and hanging. And this is before, I mean, he was married, um, obviously, but this mm-hmm. is before he'd, he'd had his family and such. Yeah. Um, and we were just, you know, hanging out and by the pool and, you know, cooking and eating and having a, having a really, really good time. So we, yeah, we all got together with massive energy in the studio. And I think we mm. recorded the majority of Take the Crown in about eight mm. to 11 days. Mm. And then there were subsequent trips after that to finish off that record. Um, right. Then from that moment, we would constantly travel, spend time with Rob um, where he was. And that began the, the story of us working with him and then working with him across all those different albums over the better part of a decade. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Cool. Well, that's, that's just about everything then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that just wraps it up. <laughs> yeah. We were all like, it, it was all obviously like to, for, for us to then go on and create Lufthouse, like from the instant there was a special connection between yeah. the three of us that obviously uh, has been maintained throughout the years. And it's a, it's definitely a creative connection, but then there's also the personal connection. Like we obviously all get on very person personally. Yeah. So like, um and Rob has had the opportunity throughout his life. He's worked with amazing people, but I think the biggest thing for Rob is to to connect and get on personally with the people he's collaborating with. Yeah. I think he will see that as the biggest indicator of whether he wants to write with someone or whether he wants to continue to write yeah. is his personal connection. I think he he wants to have fun and, and get on with the people yeah. he's working with because he can go and work with, you know, all the all the top you know songwriters are all top artists for collaboration, but I think he's drawn to yeah. personalities more so than you know yeah. if they've written ten US number ones or if he's more drawn to the individuals. Yeah, yeah. we've certainly noticed that with the people yeah. that we've spoken to through his yeah. career, and that's and what Chris Briggs said as well. Yeah, yeah, that connection is really important. Yeah, and so so 
at the time when you were first working with Rob, uh, how did it feel that Rob scrapped an album with Gary Barlow to write the uh, and release <laughs> Take the Crown with you? <laughs> Who or told did... you that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's, that's, Who said that? Uh, it, it's, it's common knowledge. It is common knowledge. It? Yeah. But no, yeah, was, Steve... that, was that a Flint's Twitter account from 2010? <laughs> We're not saying it's your fault. We're just no. saying how did you feel? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> um, yeah, when, I think some, I mean, there was obviously a couple of songs that were still on the record. Yeah. Um, most, you know, obviously Candy was a huge yeah. hit for Rob. And different. I mean, it was just like in the moment, like it was our first, it was our first, like job as yeah. uh, doing this. And it was the first time that we were like, this is, could actually be a career, you know, like it, yeah. we were kind of we were doing music, but it's, it's, it's like a, a dream, you know? And then this was like the first thing that made it real. So we, we were, I mean, we were, we were young and we were, we were like, we were very, we, we didn't get caught up in it all, but it, it all just like was, it all happened very quickly, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think- um, so I, we didn't really give it too much thought. Yeah. yeah. The bit, the bit wasn't, the bit wasn't that he scrapped a record with Gary. The bit was that he was doing a record with us. Like it was, yeah. it was more yeah. about that we were excited to be crafting these songs. Yeah. Um, and Rob and Gary have had a, you know, a beautiful creative partnership and they have this enormous history together. Yeah. Um, and I think uh, Gary pop pops up in, in Rob's life and will continue to pop yeah. up. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Whether that's collaboration, whether that's a take that, um, anything to do with a take that kind of legacy. Yeah. But yeah. for us, it was just more that like we were excited and passionate about what we were creating. We we're mm-hmm. happy to be doing it with Rob um, as a trio and it felt very natural and that, that excitement overrode any sort of um, comparison to yes. um, alternative material that had come before, you know? Yeah. Right. Yeah, and it sounds as though you were very in the moment. If if you recorded that in what did you say eight days? Yeah, wow. We yeah we did it like a ridiculous amount. I, I remember on the first day, so so we we had kind of gone. Rob had been emailing us, and then he was like, you know, come over to my place very casually, thinking that we lived in LA, <laughs> and we were like, all right, we need to get flights to LA. We need to get there, like as soon as possible. So Flynn and I kind of you know, we asked our parents if they could help us get a flight to Los Angeles and we were staying, you know, on friends' couches and we just made as much music as we could. And I think after that first day we kind of played him a bunch of, and a bunch of band songs and a bunch of stuff and he was like, what are you guys up to tomorrow? Like, are you, are you guys free to work tomorrow and stuff? And we are just like, yeah, yeah, we're free. And I think <laughs> in the first two or three days we had, we had done some, yeah, ridiculous amount of songs. Like it was kind of like three a day, just like bang, 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 and yeah, it was yeah, it was it was like yeah, eight days or something. That the majority of the album was written, so it was, it was, it all happened very quickly. And, mm-hmm. and did you already exciting. have some ideas developed that you took in, or did some of that just come from scratch out of the moment? Or? It was a bit of both, a yeah. bit of both. Like we we had we had you know, and like 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 Flynn said, some of the songs are still yet to come out. Mm. You know, like we, we had yeah. we had some ideas. A lot of the stuff we did on the spot, like it was. You guys will love this. I think, like, at the time, these songs, like, um, songs like Greenlight and Raver. Greenlight's a song I really like. Yeah, oh, I love yeah. that. Yeah, I think I think that's a really great song. Um, these were all part of the collection for the album, and then mm-hmm. for whatever reason, things you know don't go on, or there's mm. there's other songs that come up, but all of that all of those sessions those songs were born out of um but we'd often have like a musical idea yeah. like it might be music it might be a hook or we pick up a guitar and make something but it was all it was all very um fruitful and all very easy and it always has been i think with rob we always get something you know mm-hmm. we always get something so yeah um it's just about where it falls in kind of line with the other tracks or whether it's you know where you come in on this on the kind of writing cycle what ends up landing and then there are some songs that you know that we haven't put out yet that could be on the album or there are songs that are on the you know under the radar that you may have in retrospect gone oh we should have included that and take the crown or the heavy entertainment mm-hmm. show but it's all about just catching a great track you know yeah. and I mean you guys you you get to experience it too because you're avid you know 
fans of the music. Mm. Yeah. But, um, no, it's a good time. It was a really good time for all of us. So was there a song that was the easiest to write or were they just all easy? All that, easy. Yeah. Mm. So we believe it was Take the Crown's producer, Jack Knife Lee, who suggested the bridge of Raver could be turned into a full song, which became shit on the radio. Uh, which did you prefer at the time and which do you like best now? I prefer Raver. Yeah. I think Raver's a better track, in my opinion. Um, I think Shit on the Radio is a good song. I think Raver's a better track uh, for mm-hmm. my personal taste. Tim? You, that... I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah so would we. Yeah. <laughs> I can't. I can't remember Raver the recorded version. But was it under the under the radar? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah I think Raver. That's a big up and good feel good song. Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. And, uh, maybe, maybe maybe the start of Lufthouse, You know, mm-hmm. <laughs> reminiscing about the rave days. Yeah. <laughs> How did it feel when Rob released "Be a Boy" as a single? Right. Um, I mean, it was amazing. I remember, yeah, we, we went out for those 302 shows and it was, um, he gave us a little shout out and it was kind of the first time we had heard one of the songs being played in such a huge place. It was, it was pretty, um, it was, it was wild. Yeah. It's great. I get off more on the tracks being played like live, seeing them live, you know, yeah. right. these days, like, everything being digital like a single like it's muddied right Mm -hmm. it's like art like we can talk about even with lufthouse it's kind of like every track release it's like the way people consume it it's almost better to do like track 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 you know so i think that um the biggest excitement was seeing like gospel not like the others and um and beer boy live that that was the biggest thrill apart from obviously the album coming out Mm-hmm. Um, cause that was this, that was a really special tour. I think the take the crown tour, I think yeah, like, it was. they, they yeah. all have unique, um, exciting things about them. But I think take the crown was an especially epic stage production. Mm-hmm. The outdoor stadium shows, uh, Tim and I also went to Estonia for the independence day show. Um, and that was special. And then we saw some select stadium shows. And when those songs, when you see the songs that you, you wrote come on in the stadiums it's like wow that's that's really that was exciting. the most overwhelming i think yeah that was like really like whoa okay. that's more exciting for me than a, a single it's a single mm-hmm. live yeah. Yeah. yeah that that's kind of what i was referring to when you when you said be a boy i thought you meant the yeah the light when it was the songs were played live that was yeah. definitely you know really like wow this is I, real. I, um, I particularly remember not like the others on the stadium tour i just thought it sounded amazing yeah, really stood out as a moment. Yeah, it was well, just epic production, yeah. really good. So Rob, Rob sort of often says that Into the Silence is the song he's most proud of, um, and it's the song for the hardcore fans, just to let you know. Uh, it's on right. three different albums. How do you feel about it, and what's the song you're each most each most proud of? Uh, yeah, I mean, in, I love Into the Silence. I think it's one of the best songs we've written together um i think like lyrically and musically it's incredible and then live it's incredible think that yeah I, i'd love i think yeah into the silence is amazing i'd love you guys should should tell rob to to dust it off for the whatever the next tour is because i think it's such a great track yeah um and it obviously means a lot to him and the fans so i think it's it's been incredible to be part of that to and to mean that to to the fans and also to have 
for, for Rob to say it's one of his favorite songs he's done to be part of that, especially when he's written so many wow, like great yeah. songs. It's great to be to have that special place in his heart too, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I I remember we were we were in LA um uh, not that long ago, but like not in the past year, but we were, we were working on Lufthouse stuff at Rob's and he was kind of like we were doing dance music and whatnot, and then he was like, guys, come down, come downstairs. I'll, I've got a surprise for you. I've got a surprise for you. And we're like, what? And he um he put on the the orchestral version from the from the latest album. And he didn't tell us he was doing it or nothing or anything like that. And um yeah, I remember it was pretty cool being like, wow, this is this is awesome. Because it's obviously like, yeah, it's all one of our all of our favorite songs. I think it's my I think it's my dad's favorite song as well of what we've done. So it was really nice for him to like keep it a bit of a secret and then just play it to us in the studio. It was it's a nice moment. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> Motherfucker's so, a really good song too. Oh yeah. Oh yes. <laughs> yeah, we'll come to that. I'm gonna perform that with Rob. Amazing. Around 2015, I think we did a few shows, and that's a really and acoustically it's really good too. You know. Yeah. I think acoustically is the real. Yeah. The, the truest version of the track. Right. Um, because you really like hear that story, and um. I think it's a really good song, motherfucker. I love not like the others too. Mm -hmm. Um, I really like not like the others. I really like gospel. Yeah. Um. And then I really like the green light. I mean, I'm just looking at the looking at the songs on under the radar. Um. H E S. Surrender was always a big one for me. Right. Yeah. I'm not sure if it was if the, the, the lyric. I think the lyric might have changed. The lyric. H, oh yeah, HES was also great. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. Surrender for me was was a good one. I think that might have, might have changed. Might be called No Surrender now. Or is it called Surrender? I'm not, I'm not too sure. But yeah, it's called Surrender. surrender yeah. Yeah. yeah HES is one of my favorites for sure. Mm -hmm. I think that is a really really good song. And you got, I think it live, it's really good. You guys are at the Roundhouse, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was amazing. That was incredible. incredible. Run It Wild's a great song. Yeah. Yeah. You know? um, yeah, there's a lot of good ones in there. So many. Um, I we have to say under, that. We love the Under the Radar. So, so yeah. <laughs> I mean, I'm a little bit biased, but yeah. Um, and going back to gospel, I have to say, I think that's one of my favorite outros of a Robbie song. The way that ends, I just absolutely love it. It's brilliant. <laughs> that was a good moment live, wasn't it? When the, when oh. the thing came up and it was like. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I think Rob should have a little under the radar segment in all, like in his songs where he, you know, out in his, on his tour, when maybe he plays like one or two of them, you know. Yeah. Oh, um, we'd love that. In, in, in whatever, whatever. <laughs> Man, we keep trying to encourage him to do that kind of thing, but uh, <laughs> he's just don't he's, give up. Just keep, <laughs> keep well, you know, Rob probably well better than we do, but he he is always nervous to play a song that doesn't lift the crowd or create the energy in 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 the 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 general sort of population of the crowd, not just for the hardcore fans. So I think he's, I think he'd love to do it, but he's yeah. just nervous about how it might go down. But um, we'd love to hear it. I'm sure it, I'm sure it would work. He could yeah. easily do what Taylor Swift does and just do like one song each night, yeah. change it each night. Mm. That would be amazing. I remember doing um, The Motherfucker. I think we were in Paris or somewhere and we, mm -hmm. we would stop and then he'd be like, you're a bad motherfucker. And like then the whole crowd would sing it back. <laughs> and I remember after I was like, oh, my God, everyone everyone knew the song. That was so amazing. They all know it. And he's like, no, Tim, the first 10 rows knew it. No one else knew this. <laughs> <laughs> I was humbled. I was like, oh, okay. Well. <laughs> yeah, first ten rows can be quite loud. <laughs> Hi, I'm Robbie Williams, and you're listening to Robbie Williams Rewind with the Champions. So, uh, yeah. one of our listeners, Chris Lamble, says that "Be a Boy" is his favourite Robbie song, and he loved the remix you played on tour last year. Do you have any plans to release it? Have you, or would you remix other Robbie songs? You know, it's funny. We were actually, Flynn and I were having this conversation oh. earlier, so I'll let Flynn answer the question. Okay. <laughs> well, 
if I'm if I'm gonna be honest, um, <laughs> I, I love the track, right? I love the keyboard. Um, <laughs> didn't love the remix. Like I, Tim, oh, okay. <laughs> Tim made the full disclosure. Tim made the remix. <laughs> yeah, it's on me. It's on no, me. It, it comes out. But I'll and, take and the, I, the I think it's great. Like, people love it. Like <laughs> I'm not saying it's just it's just a personal thing. Um, and as the Lufthouse shows kept going on, right, we felt that we wanted to focus more on new material. <laughs> like we we do we do and would and will remix like you know other rubby snippets. I think like especially if um, if if we perform as Lufthouse, I think it would be exciting to have some snippets of a house version of you know Love Like mm. DJ like yeah. get even some acapellas, um, if, you know, getting access to some of those vocal stems and creating innovative, fresh things is something we love. Yeah. Uh, so I think Tim's remix is amazing. It'd be a boy. I just didn't personally love it. And I thought <laughs> as we would continue to perform that we should focus more on the look because it's hard to bridge the, I mean, this is a whole other hour, but playing a yeah. live set, I think we balanced it well. Once we got to Europe, we had the mix of, mm-hmm. Um, the DJing, the mix of the live performance, and I think it was a good balance. And I think having the Be A Boy track in there was just one too many of that, you know, mm-hmm. of that style of <clears throat> we want to focus more on the the future, you know, of what we, <laughs> what we were doing, the Lufthouse record, playing yeah. those songs, road testing those songs. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, we could easily release the remix. If, we can just send it to that guy. Give me a <laughs> okay i'll send you his email address <laughs> like quite dramatically i said to tim i'm like tim i want you to bury the usb with that remix. <laughs> <laughs> actually going to bury it we actually have yeah, yeah we're going to have a ceremony for it <laughs> after england um but, but but yeah definitely definitely some um some other stuff uh, in the same ilk in the cards for future shows uh, cool. In the works, I can Great. confirm. Excellent. Good. So, um, Flynn, Rob initially listed Run It Wild as a track that would appear on Under the Radar 1, but then it appeared on Under the Radar 2. And I believe you wanted it for your own record. Is that is that what happened? And then it I can't just... recall exactly. I think that at the time there was a lot of songs floating around. I think Under the Radar, I mean, I think Run It Wild was even earmarked for Take the Crown. Mm-hmm. Um but we we did have about 20, 25 tracks for Take the Crown. Um, and then I think it may have even been earmarked for Heavy Entertainment Show at a point in time. Um, but there were songs at the time that we were considering releasing on our by ourselves. Um, but I think, yeah, it found a home on Under the Radar Volume 2. Right. Yeah. Cool. And Tim, you had a bit of a personal campaign to get Rob to play HES on the Let Me Entertain You tour. Apparently, you were planning on playing HES and Motherfucker together in Barcelona, but during rehearsal, Rob kept screwing up the lyrics and decided he didn't want to do HES that night. So he asked you to come on and sing Angels instead. You finally Wait, so played. Where do you, where do you get this information? <laughs> Research. Where, where do you. <laughs> Very, very. We've got we've got a very good researcher here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Apparently, um, you finally yeah. played HES and motherfucker with Robin Paris instead. So how good was that? <laughs> it's a long question. Yeah, it was amazing. Right we went, we went. We, I went to Barcelona. Um, I think I was. We were, no, was it? But where where did we do it? Sorry, with the Angels. Was that Barcelona? Barcelona. Barcelona. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so I think I went to Madrid. And we were staying in Barcelona and I think my family and stuff, we were like on a trip and we had kind of made it around the tour because we knew I was playing. And we went to that arena in Madrid and we we sound checked it and the place was huge and Rob was just like, he's like, this place is too big. I, I don't I don't want to. We, we Yeah, he was just like, he couldn't remember the words or something. The story is, yeah, that's absolutely correct. And so then mm. he's like, just come and do Angels. And I was like, okay, better learn how to play that then. <laughs> so I had a couple of hours to learn how to do that. And then uh, I think um, I actually like it, he didn't really know what was going on. I didn't really, no one really knew what was going on, but I think I like ran across the stage and like might have tapped him on the bum and he was 
thought it was someone about to push him off the stage or something. He said it gave him the shock of his life. <laughs> so it was, it was quite funny. Um, so I think he forgot yeah, that he'd asked you to come on. Yeah, I think I think he had, yeah. And so when I kind of <laughs> snuck up and came behind him, his heart has stopped in the end of the first verse of Angels or whenever it was. But, yeah, that was a, that was a fun time. And then when you did get to Paris, you did get to play HES, the motherfucker. Yes. Yeah, it was great. I mean, that was when I was saying I was I was probably in in my own uh, running off adrenaline and, and and in my my own world when I was like, oh, they all loved it. You know, everyone knew it. And that was when he was like, no, Tim, it was just the <laughs> front, front two rows. <laughs> but um, but we we did a few shows and then we we kept playing that. I think um, like we we did Australia with Flynn as well. Yeah, which you could say is the were the first Lufthouse shows. <laughs> So all three of you on stage together. Yeah, which was a lot of fun. Um, and then Flynn, you obviously sung Run It Wild with um, and Reverse with Rob at the Under the Radar gig. Did mm-hmm. you love that gig as much as we did? Yeah, I think it was really good. I think it was a really good night. I think it was good because everyone in the house was a massive fan. And you probably, like, it was a one-off, you know? Yeah. So I think that makes it even more special. I think it was one of, did Rob say it was one of his favourite shows? Yeah. Yeah. So I think it was just, yeah, there was a lot of really good positive vibes in the house. Everyone really loved it. And it was special because it was a one-off. Yeah. Gig, you know? Yeah. And a lot of the songs he played were written with you that night. Nine out of 21 of yeah, the songs. Yeah. Yeah. No. Yeah. Very good times. <laughs> there was a special energy in there. I think I think he found it very freeing. And I, I, I loved what he said at the beginning, you know, like, if someone's dragged you along to this gig expecting you're going to hear, um, let me entertain you in Angels, you're not. <laughs> so if you want to leave now, then I'm not going to be offended. And he just literally paused and <laughs> literally tried, waited for people. Nobody got up. Nobody left at it. No. I think everyone knew what they were in for. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Raver was a particular highlight that, oh, that night. I think it really faves. went down. Yeah. I've just seen some videos of it. It looks great. Yeah. It's unfortunate you weren't there, Tim. Yeah, I don't know where I was, but I was very jealous to miss it. Yeah. Mm. It's the kind of gig that we'd like to go to more often. So hopefully we're hoping it's not a one-off, but you yeah. know, Rob keeps saying he might do another one at some point. But I, you know, Maybe we great. dust him off at a Lufthouse show and we just yeah. rub. Like guitars. <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, sorry to interrupt this show, but now we're going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. That would be great. <laughs> we delve into our back catalogue. <laughs> And you sometimes write with other collaborators on Rob's songs, so people like Philip Steinke, uh, Bar- Piers Barron, Conrad Olsen. How do they fit into the picture for you? Uh, I think they've come in from like a musical arrangement perspective. Yeah. Uh, or some just friends. Like, you know. Yeah. Sometimes it's us like working with other musicians, that we friends that we love and admire. Um, right. And then sometimes you might be like, oh, hey, what do you think? Is Is there a bridge here? Are there some changes here? And just you, sit, you know, when you're preparing for a session um, or a sprint, you know, a writing sprint, you might bring in some other talented musicians to help you. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Or you may have co-conceived it together, you know, mm-hmm. in the yeah. past for not that purpose. So, yeah. right. Um, and then we've also noted when reviewing all of Rob's songs track by track on the podcast that often your bridges in the songs that you've written really stand out and are like some of our favourite bits in the song. Is that due to your backing track or like Rob's melodies or like all of you together? What due makes... to our talent. Yeah. <laughs> um, and our superb songwriting ability. Um, yeah. <laughs> their emotion. And um, yeah. No, I think it's good. Changes are good. You know, I mean, some songs, uh, there are none. Some songs there are. And I think it's just, you don't know what is going to hit. You know, you don't know what is going to connect. 
Um, cause it's, it's about also it connecting with Rob when we're riding with Rob, right? Yeah. You need it to make sense for him. You need him to be excited. Um, you want him to be passionate about it. Um, but the best songs are the ones that bring out the best out of Rob too, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's just about providing a framework. Sometimes you come in with a really strong idea, like a melody, a lyric, the track. Other times it's just the track and then Rob will, you know, add his magic to it. Yeah. yeah. So you've got quite a few songs featured on the Christmas present. Did you purposely write those for the Christmas present or were some of them kind of written as music and then Rob just happened to add Christmas lyrics to them? I think it was, it was, it was a, it was a time we were in, I mean, I can't, what year was this again? So it came out in 2019. I think whenever Rob was writing an album, we would come up with a bunch of ideas. So they were definitely probably written in a, in a Christmas theme with the right. Christmas mind, the arrangement. Yeah. No, definitely songs that would we were, we were trying to get on the album. Yeah, I, I used to um I used to we're in LA at Rob's house. I used to work out of his studio in his house. So I was there like all the time. So I think and I'm not sure it wasn't like a specific thing, but I, th I think I might have done one one song on that album or one or two. But um, it, he just kind of came down and was like, "I need this song for this. Like, let's do it." So it was definitely from scratch. Like it was nothing nothing planned. Mm -hmm. Maybe some of the stuff that Flynn and I did together or Flynn did with might have been yeah. But I think that uh, I can't remember. What's, uh, not Christmas. I did it with Carl, Carl Brazil. Yeah. Yeah, that one. It was just, just kind of we just did it from start to finish in an afternoon. Right, okay. Yeah, you got quite there's quite a few songs on the album. We've got One Last Christmas, Idlewild, Happy Birthday, Jesus Christ. Sorry, Idlewild. Maybe that was mm. a, I, I can't even remember. I should have done more research before. Oh, yeah, that sorry. Was with Carl, yeah. Yeah, Idlewild, Idlewild. Idlewild yeah. was the one that you did. That's with one, Carl, yeah, yeah, that's the one. Yeah. Snowflakes, that's a good song. Mm -hmm. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> And obviously we've just talked about Christmas, but just in, in general, do you have a particular approach to your songwriting and musical development? Is, is there a particular sort of way in which you go about developing new material? No, not really. Um, I mean, I know that's a boring answer. I don't really have an approach. Yeah. Uh, like sometimes melodic ideas come to you that are strong yeah. But a lot of the time when we're working with electronic music, the music comes first. Right. 99% of the time because you create this beat, you create an atmosphere, and then you come up with some top line. So usually usually with electronic, 99% of the time be music first. Yeah. yeah. The other thing with the songs, with the with the with the the Robbie Williams, um, it'd be probably fifty fifty. They probably yeah. vibe, musical vibe, and then a lyric. Um, but then it would other times be hook and then the bass around the hook. But for Lufthouse, it's 99%. I'd say music first. Mm -hmm. Right, okay. Love is a dagger in the killing fields. How does it feel? When you make me bleed. No heart should... So moving on to Lift House, what made you both decide to move into electronic dance music? Um, well, Flynn was living in Berlin. I, I was living in Los Angeles and we kind of, we're both kind of doing a lot. We'd both obviously done lots of pop music and stuff like that. And it just seemed really exciting. It was, it seemed like the industry was kind of popping off and it was something that we hadn't really touched on. Um, whereas it had obviously blown up in 2008, nine, you know, worldwide, but in, in the commercial aspect of it. But um, so we just found it exciting. I was going to move to Berlin um, and we just started working on a bunch of uh, like techno ideas. I, I think I spent a summer out there in 2019 I think it was before COVID um with Flynn and and we just kind of really got engrossed in the whole industry and everything about it we just like kind of loved it and then of course COVID happened so I moved back to Australia and 
think Flynn stayed in Berlin or he came back to Australia for a bit, but that was kind of how the Lufthouse connection came about because Rob was like, what are you guys up to? Like, what are you working on? And we were like, well, we're doing electronic music. This is what we want to do now. And he was like, well, can I do it too? <laughs> <laughs> Can't was, see why that would. <laughs> there was, yeah, I, Tim, and, so Tim and I, our new project was going to be an electronic project. And then I recall I was in Melbourne. Oh, yeah, I'd flown back from Berlin and it was March 2020. I, and my, I'd flown from like the 1st to the 20th to see my family, see my mum and dad. And Tim was in LA and Rob was due to play the Grand Prix. Mm-hmm. That's right. Right. And I was in his hotel room with my laptop and some monitors. And that's when I began to play him what Tim and I were working on. Right. Right. So there were some songs there. All of them have survived. I'm not, I can't recall which ones are on the album, but they all survived. They're all, they're all recorded. They're all finished. So in the hotel room and then Rob got the call that the Grand Prix had been cancelled. So this is like the eve of what yeah. have been like 16th something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I got stuck in Australia till July or June. Oh, no. Um, and then I think Tim returned. I think we did it. We did my birthday and it was April. Yeah, you, you came back shortly thereafter, Tim. And yep. then in that time we began really actively writing the, the project. We didn't have a name at the time. Mm-hmm. Or, or necessarily style. Then mm-hmm. I went and saw, and then I went and I saw Rob. I, I flew to Rob, and we continued to to record and write the um the album. And we did stuff over Zoom. We did voice notes. I think some of the voice notes he recorded on his phone actually ended up on the album. <laughs> that is um, mad. So we banked twenty five tracks off that session and then we flew out Tim and I again and we banked like another five or six. Um, So there's another album that's finished. And the songs are, some of the songs are, uh, you know, just as good if not better because we've learned a lot too from the recording process and from performing it live. Yeah. Um, And then I, yeah, I've also plans to to resume writing with rob for the new for the to bank another you know bunch of creative ideas too um and i think the lufthouse project it was different to his album right Mm -hmm. because when when you're writing a rob williams album it's an amazing experience but i also think like for rob um it's probably more challenging. I think, I think he, I think he said that too. I think it's like, because you're not just weighing the the track, it's against all your other songs and it's against how it fits on the record and the track order. And then you think about taking it to radio and the singles and, Mm -hmm. you know, he's had, what is it? 15 number ones albums. And there's a lot, I mean, he, he writes for pleasure and he writes for, cause he's incredibly good at it. But then there's also that voice in the back of your yeah. mind going, I want to write, you know, I want a single on radio. I want to write um, the number one album and uh, all these things. And I think the Lufthouse project, it takes all the walls down because yeah. obviously we want commercial success. We want people to love the music when people dance to it, but we're not thinking about, like, oh, is this going to land with, you know, Radio 1 or Radio 2? Uh, how, what's the opening week going to be? It's yeah. more, that's an idea, that's a mood, that's a vibe. And then that for, for Tim and I gives us freedom and then for Robert gives freedom. So it's kind of this like protection aura around the project because you're not bound by um, the enormity of legacy, right? You're, you, yeah. you, are, you are free to create yeah to have fun and to try things, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Try and if you if you miss, you're not you're not missing. You're just you've explored a a um as Tim said in the motion of feeling. Mm. Uh, 
it was a quote <laughs> from the album, but like these kind of things, like that, that, that I think keeps it fresh and fun for Rob right. too, as well as us, because we've done and had amazing fun writing the Robbie Williams songs. Yeah. And now you kind of step into this different thing where th- there's a pressure on yourself to create something amazing, but there's not the pressure from the outside to try to land that single, to try and yeah. land the number one, right? Yeah. I think there's a freedom in that, which we which we all love, you know? And we could we could sense and feel his passion for EDM because yeah. in the chat room and on some of his Insta lives, he, he used to mention it every now and again. You know, I really love to make an EDM album. So obviously that must have been in the early days when he was probably talking to you about it and he yeah. was you could you could just yeah. see the spark in his eyes you know yeah. when he said it and he didn't and then he didn't want to say much more but he he would keep saying it every now and again when he i'd love to do that so yeah really really cool that it's come to life yeah and then it travel like that music kind of travels like electronic music you can have it on to dance to you can have it on to to, to chill like it's <laughs> it's it's got a, a um a kind of lightness to it, you know, because it can be played and shared with at parties mm. or, um, and I think it's refreshing for Rob to inhabit the character of, of someone in a, you know, an electronic music group, because yep. then it's obviously there's always going to be huge focus on Rob, but then there's also like, you know, as, as we saw on the tour, me singing some songs and, and us, Tim and I, you know, DJing and it's not always, mm performance is not always like vocal 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 there's always yeah. that, that yeah. moment when you pull back and it's people are happy um in electronic music when you to listen mm. to a nine minute track you know mm. and it doesn't have to be stuff happening all the time yeah mm-hmm. I think it's very exciting and also yeah. it's, it's a different format to explore and then rob has as you mentioned this huge past in house um what was it that the club in Manchester um, from 24 hour party people, what was it that? Oh, I can't remember what that's called. Hacienda was Hacienda. Oh, Hacienda. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The mythology around this, yeah. it was, mm. this dance music culture is and was a huge part of Rob's upbringing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And at the time when Take That was taking off in, in the late eighties, early nineties, I think his musical taste was hugely in line with that sound Mm-hmm. Yeah. those groups and those cuts, those records. Yeah. So it's kind of like a full circle thing too because it's Rob also going back to his taste, his love mm-hmm. of dance, the escapism of dance music. the Because anony- dance music is very anonymous too when you're on a dance for the anonymity. Like um, anthems are shared moments, you know, yeah. whereas – the, the dance music is it's anonymous but shared too you know yeah. so sharing it but there's this 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 it's a different thing right mm-hmm. which I think Rob is drawn to also and speaking of anonymous was it Rob's idea to keep his identity hidden at first I, I can't I can't really remember I might have been the, the record labels idea right. I think we just I mean uh, we wanted to to seed it as something organic at the beginning. Because it's like on the time scale, it was always going to come out, right? So it's nice to kind of keep things under wraps at the beginning because we see Lufthouse as, you know, we're going to keep making music. We're going to keep refining the live show. It will probably take on many different forms. You know, there may be Lufthouse shows where it's just Tim and I DJing or we're, we've got a, you know, I'm singing a track. There'll be shows with Rob. As, as a focus piece too. And because we, we see it as like having different forms and so a project that we're going to invest in over many years and keep growing, ha- having Rob as a secret vocalist for the first three months, it's like, it's nothing in the time scale, right? Yeah. Right. I think it just lended some weight. Um, that this is something that we're all taking seriously and we didn't mm-hmm. want to necessarily come out and say like, you know, um, Robbie Williams' new dance mm-hmm. project from the beginning. Right. Because we were thinking of it on such a long time scale, we'd introduce it slowly. And that way, it's a campaign that, you know, would gradually reveal itself. Yeah. Yeah. And who came up with the name? I be- was it you, Flynn? I think it was me. 
I, yeah, I think it was me or Rob. I think like I think we, we liked some of the the German language is rich for mm. names and languages, right? Like for 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 Brand and Luft <laughs> House is such a great it's such a great name. We're surprised it wasn't taken, and it's so hard to name a band, guys. Like I can't tell you naming a band because ninety nine percent of it's taken. Yeah, so find two <laughs> things that are like instantly record because luft is familiar right it like you see it especially if you're living in europe it's like everywhere um and house obviously is quite familiar too so yeah. to combine yeah. them it, it was very strong and i think it's it's something that sounds like it's always been there too you know so we we're quite happy when we found out we could use the name um i think yeah rob mentioned something luft and there was a house thing and then it came together right yeah so you you produced all the songs as well. There wasn't any other producers involved, is there? No. Well, we we used a Tim, one of Tim's own dash part. Um, did some additional. Oh, okay. Across the tracks. Yeah. Another guy, Ryan, who we've been working with on the the next album. Um, yeah, we do. We we you know. But ma- mainly it's mainly it's Tim it's myself. Yeah. <laughs> right. And how did you secure Sophie Ellis Baxter for Immortal, which I absolutely love, by the way? Rob did that. That was Rob's magic. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure about how it came about, but um, I remember I think he emailed um, the track to her um, and she came back with this amazing hook. And I think it's just all time. That hook yeah. Is so yeah. The two of them on that track. Like, I think the the just, contrast of their vo- vocals is yeah. just amazing, really incredible yeah we had to do a few versions of that song the version that she wrote to is not anywhere near the version that it is today okay like it was very much in its embryonic stage and then she had done this huge thing and it obviously had that great piano line but we were kind of like we need to bring this up to the level that she's she, she kind of elevated the track and then we're like all right so we went back maybe two or three times, I think, Flynn, and we were just like, no, this isn't good enough. Um, so we re- we really, uh, yeah, put a lot into that track to try and get it. And, uh, yeah, that was probably the last song that was finished on the album mm-hmm. and one of the earlier songs that was written on the album, but the last yeah. song to be finished because we just kind of were like, we need to. Right. And I think Sophie's voice is one of the best recorded voices. This is like a producer engineer thing. I think she's got one of the best recorded voices mm-hmm. like on earth and tim and i obviously grew up and those songs like um if you know um what was it if called? loving to yeah, yeah, murder, murder, murder on the dance floor. Murder on the dance floor yeah so all <laughs> these so it's amazing to have someone as talented as sophie um and who's been you know been around and had success over so many years to be part of the project so we feel very fortunate and very thankful to her for, for lending her beautiful voice and songwriting skills to the track. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely iconic. Hey, so. <laughs> she don't stand at all. She don't really mess with alcohol. Why was the lyric in alcohol changed from she'd only fuck with alcohol to mess with alcohol? Because there was a demo that Rob played on Instagram Live where oh, he, I just he think sung the fuck, fuck with alcohol. We, 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 you know, we're, we're family men. Um, <laughs> you know, we, <laughs> I'm going to better play at home. <laughs> we, you know, we, I think it's hey, that's fuck's good, but it's nice. That mess, mess is great, you know. Yeah. And, um, you know, I think he says, does he say fuck on the record? One time. There is, yeah, on a, another song. Um, Did you say it at all on the track? Not on the, no, not, no, on, not on alcohol, no. There's one explicit, isn't there? I like, I mean, yeah. I like, 
I like fuck, but we, we've used a lot what, of fuck. What song is there an explicit on? Because um, initially Vito is like very good. Uh, I, I'm act, I'm, the, I'm very I'm the conservative member of Love's House. Like, I'm like, oh, <laughs> I changed that fucking to a um. Mason's daughter has an explicit listing on Spotify anyway. So yeah, that's, that's the good. only that's, that's the only it. one with an explicit. I think he says shit in that. That's it. No, it says and, fuck. Yeah. <laughs> oh, fucking around. Oh, oh, I yeah. got through Flynn. I I, <laughs> I like fuck um, <laughs> as, as a term um, in the song, but I think the mess. I think it just phonetically like she really mess. It's just kind of like a. It, it was just kind of grooved a bit more. You know, okay. or a song. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. like Rob would never do anything he didn't want to do. So obviously the mess resonates with him too. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
think it's 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 a really really cool thing. So yeah, we're, we're very fortunate to have been able to use their their creations to mm. to make the Lufthouse visuals all mm. that more impressive. Yeah. yeah, and it's an instantly recognizable style and brand now. It just even even though the images are quite abstract and quite different, there's, there's you just know Lufthouse. <laughs> Exactly. We also noticed lots of little details in the album cover. Like it looks like it says Tim in one of the faces. Have you noticed that? I haven't. We had, we had the <laughs> microscope out. We were looking at it. In detail. Well, no, we had Just it on the big telly. So. Hidden, <laughs> hidden messages on there. <laughs> you didn't draw any of it yourselves at all then. It's literally just Rob and Ed. I personally haven't. I'm not no. sure about Flynn. Um, uh, it's no, mostly but, uh, Rob, Rob. Rob did did love like on some canvases we would contribute like some swells and such but, oh, yeah. and some dots like he was very good um he was really good about having like his friends you know mm. participate and contribute in in the making of some of the canvases but these these ones were were all by Ed and and Rob okay yeah. so do you prefer doing pop Robbie or Lufthouse Robbie? Do you, do you still write pop songs together? That's a tough question to ask you, isn't it? I know that. <laughs> we have to say Lufthouse, right? right. <laughs> yeah. Let's stay true yeah, to I the think, brand. I think, yeah, look, just for the reasons I said before, like we've yeah. done, we've had amazing, you know, personal success with writing great songs with Robbie Williams for Robbie Williams. Yeah. And we will always be on call to collaborate with him on anything he wants to collaborate on. But having the Lufthouse banner, um, I think, is a freedom for all of us that we perhaps didn't have when trying to write the traditional tracks. Mm-hmm. You know, and as a, as a writer, you you kind of evolve and your interests change over time too. And I think having the the Lufthouse um, project it provides us with more of that um, that personal creative freedom to to have fun and to throw around different electronic moods and ideas that are probably personally more fulfilling for Tim and myself. Yeah. And what's it been like supporting Rob on tour? Have you got any favorite gigs? Um, it's been great. Um, the one in Croatia in, in uh, Pula. Oh was yeah. Pula, yeah, that was, yeah. That was, that was pretty, um, pretty special show in that Col- Coliseum. And um, one of the best shows was in, uh, was it Frankfurt, Flynn, where they – I think the arena basically didn't have – it had seating, but it was kind of first in, first serve. So oh. everyone, it was just absolutely packed. By the time we even came on stage, everyone was just like <laughs> drinking and rearing to go and they were just, you know, people yeah, people going wild. So that those two for me really stood out, I think. But Flynn? P- Pula was the best for, for us, for me, yeah, because it was – the Coliseum and the crowd was just being in such a historical place with so much history and, and the crowd were really into it. Like the, the footage, I think it's on our Instagram. They were really yeah. engaged. Um, all the German, sh- the German shows were really good. Like all of them were like, even Tim, like Munich, like when, when Rob did that hundred thousand people gig in 2021, like 2022. Um, the, all the we did ten shows in Germany in this arena, and they, like Hamburg, Cologne, like they were all right. really good. Frankfurt was especially good because, as Tim mentioned, the venue was was beautiful. But the Germans really got around it. Um, I think the last two nights in Amsterdam were really good too, if I recall, Tim. Like that was a really yeah, really good right. feedback. And I think I think so, as like the year progressed, um, and like the music kind of like you know became more familiar to maybe the fans that kind of helped a lot as well. Yeah. And so, then in the, Paris the was really good too. Paris was really strong. Um, I, if I recall correctly. And then, yeah, the, I mean, there were some really, really good shows. I think, I think we, we have footage from every show. We have like lots of photos. So I'd have to revisit it to give you the, the definitive mm. okay. take. And then Bologna night one was really good too. Night one and two, Tim, the opening was really good. Right. Yeah. The Italians were really, really great crowd. Yeah. And you also played some after parties in small venues in cities, in a few cities that when you were on tour, 
How does it compare playing those smaller gigs to huge stadiums like Munich or Port Vale, for instance? I think it's all fun. It's all it's all kind of part of it. Like, you know, what what we play on the stage, you know, if it's in like a stadium or if it's in an arena or if it's in a club, it's like it's quite different. So I think that kind of keeps it fresh and exciting for us. Mm. Um, you know, and, and then also the, the depends on the club. Like I think in Barcelona it was like a a different type of place till we played this kind of techno club in the middle of nowhere in Belgium, I remember. And that was like, you know, so then that's like a kind of completely different set from the club in Barcelona. So it, it kind of keeps it fresh, which I think keeps it exciting, um, which keeps it fun, you yeah. know? And Rob said he found the Ibiza performances into 2022 a little bit awkward because everyone was expecting him to entertain. Do you think he will appear with you somewhere again? Oh, I, th- I think I think I think it was you know it was the first show for all of us and we we hadn't done anything we didn't we hadn't really you know so I think that's only natural but um I definitely think there'll be some stuff coming up in the future. I think it was unannounced. His involvement was unannounced, and yeah, the range of it happened. I believe Rob was there in Ibiza at the time, and I believe the shows came together very quickly, and there were three very different venues Mm -hmm. right so there was no consistency there was the the night venue a small club and then a day a daytime club yeah um and we kind of went all in in the deep end right like there was the there was no rehearsal there was no announcement at the time about Mm -hmm. the house yeah Um, it was just kind of i don't think we even had music released right we did but there was no involvement of i don't think rob was involved it wasn't officially announced at that point, no. Right. It was very like bang. And then obviously when you're having vocals um, in an electronic performance, there's certain considerations that need to be had. So I think that um, the shows were really fun to do. But if you know, if we were doing planning stuff in the future, we would spend definitely a lot more time right. in relationship to planning the show for the venue, for the crowd, mm-hmm. et cetera. But this was kind of like a... I just um, go for it, um, go in the deep end, um, and I think for Rob, it's 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 always that you know that fun challenge because you're used to entertaining so well, right? Like yeah. he's, he's the best entertainer, and then if you haven't coordinated what you're not doing in between the the, the singing, um, you just don't know what to do with your hands. So you just yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> like yeah, no, like what, kind of like oh, should I go over here? Should I say this? But um. <laughs> When when we do return to the live stage as a, as a trio, I think it's going to be a really, really special, really in, amazing, amazing experience. Cool. So I'd Thank recommend you. getting there if if and when that that those shows are announced. I would I would get there. Because <laughs> of- <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> We're really going to take our time with this one. So yeah. <laughs> I'm the guest list. Yeah. We'll be there. Didn't Rob say on the interview with us, didn't he say that um, there was a point where he Googled what the DJs say? Yeah. Because he wanted, he, wanted, he wanted some things to be able to say on stage that sounded cool. And, yeah. Uh, oh, that was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure he sounded cool. He was dust. So. <laughs> and um, so what happened to Rob's idea of opening an art gallery that has a DJ set in the evening in Berlin? Is that something that's still still on the boil? I think everything's open. I think mm-hmm. it's just like you can't um, – I, I just get confused with the years. Like he he has so many amazing projects. Yeah. That are, I think like he's got um, – and he's one of the people that he talks about stuff and does it, you know. So, I mean, he's got, you know, the, the Netflix documentary, yeah. he's got a movie. Um, yeah. He's got the R, he's got so many things and he's just done, I think, I mean, you guys would know this more than me, but has this been the most shows he's ever played in the year? Yeah, he's done, he's doing 85 so dates on this out, tour. So, this tour. Yeah. yeah. So it's about, you know, planning, passion and patience with these things and um, that these ideas I'm sure will have the live day, like the, the, time in the in the, in the in the daylight it's just about deciding you know the right time to do it the right, right. context to do it 
but we definitely have a lot of exciting things planned for Lufthouse beyond. I mean, we end the, the tour in Australia. We do, we have 10, sh- 10 shows there. And then we're, you know, Tim and I are already focused on album two. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Focused on playing live. We're focused on a live show. We're focused on working Rob into the live show. Yeah. Um, we're focused on reworking some, some of his tracks into the live show too. So you, I think. Right. Be, yeah. So seekers, seekers of light, staring at the black night satellite, out of the chaos, out of control. I think you might have said this through the interview, but what's, what's the best thing about working with Rob? I think it's the energy, the energy and the positivity. Mm-hmm. It's talent. Like I, I think people don't. I think people would be sh- not shocked, but blown away. I think is the term by how talented he is. So he has an uncanny ability to turn on the tap and pour out amazing ideas. You know, mm-hmm. I mean, I I think think too. Yeah, yeah and, and I think Rob Rob is also like. He's also good at a lot of things. Like he's also quite athletic. Um, I remember, I remember that Tim and I were doing this. We we're in, I think we we're in LA, and we were, I think Rob could do the most push-ups and the most like a whole plank for the longest. <laughs> then he does like the art. Like he's he's got the fashion. He's got he's got so many things that he's good at. And I think when you're working with someone that is very good, it elevates you to be very good or, or yeah. to aspire to be better. So yeah. I think the best thing is like, obviously the, the friendship, the relationship, the love, the respect, but then like when you're going in, you don't know what you're going to get, but you know, it's going to be good. You know, it might not ever come out, but you're never going to go away from that going like, Oh, you know, that was, that was mm-hmm. underwhelming. It's always, it's always very, very exciting and very, yeah, you very, very fun. Yeah. You always come out of it really buzzing from a session or, you know, you come, come out with something that didn't exist yeah. an hour earlier. How the fuck did that happen? But it does. Yeah. And he seems to be constant. <laughs> <laughs> so if you could rewind back to one moment in your career and relive it, what would it be? Hmm. I mean, that's a very, that's, that's like a very big question. Yeah, it is. <laughs> I just feel like I'm so like, just looking for, it's always the next thing, you know, I'm always like, what we're going to do next, what the show is going to be, what song, what, you know, the album, yeah. what's this going to yeah. sound like, how we're going to do this show. I, I, I just, yeah, my brain doesn't work like that. <laughs> <laughs> probably, but there's probably, been amazing, there's been amazing times. Right. <laughs> I'd probably do choose two things. It'd probably be like, prob- I mean, probably the feeling of the first time we met Rob, like to rewind to that because that's like before everything, right? Yeah. And I'd probably rewind to, I'd probably like to do Munich again with the show that we mm-hmm. have now. Yeah. So that was a very, very, um, couldn't be more different to what we have now. Mm-hmm. So probably like if we could deliver a full scale production to that crowd, that would have been amazing. That would be amazing, right? Yeah. Or, or just just to to build on that, it's like our our first the first show we kind of played. Um, I think there was like twenty five thousand people in 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 Stoke, yeah, in um, Port Vale, yeah. And then that was our, our essentially our second show. It was like one hundred and twenty thousand people, yeah. And obviously, like from from then to now. You know, we've done. I think we've done 50, 50 arena shows, um, plus obviously other heaps of other shows. So, from from where we were then to where it is now, it's like we we really um, threw ourselves in the deep end, and it was like, okay, we 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 learned on the boards, yeah. as they say. <laughs> you know, obviously that's that's just how it is, and it's, it's. I mean, it's been amazing, and it continues to be so. What would you got, Matt and Lucy? What would you like to see? What what would what would really what would what are what are three things you would <laughs> like to see from Lufthouse? Oh, 
That's another big question. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what do you want from us? <laughs> I think, yeah, a gig with Rob, obviously, because you are Lufthouse, the three of you. Yep. And so to see him with you, yeah. it does need to be that at some point. Yeah. And um, I love the idea. And obviously this is, you know, this idea is the one that's on the book. I love the idea of being in a club, not a super club, like not 15,000 people, but in, in, a, in a reasonably sized club with the artwork, with the visuals, with the whole theme, the whole Lufthouse theme going on, you know, and, and, and you guys and Rob being in that as well. So like a very, a very experiential version of Lufthouse would be, I think that'd be really cool. Yeah, that would be cool. Yeah. I can't think of a third at the moment. <laughs> uh, third. Putting us on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, don't I, want, I want to see him in Ibiza. Really, uh, that, that's the other thing. But you know that I'd yeah, love to have been at one of your gigs in Ibiza. We love the idea. We're like, I mean, I'll tell you like about what I'd love to do. Right outside the music, we'd love to have, um, you know, the idea of residencies. Right, mm. Where you can walk into a beautiful venue with a, an amazing production like build out the show with the venue build out the lighting design build out the you know the the video visual effects and and create a really exciting immersive experience that has mm -hmm. some some singing some really great music and you leave you know after two hours like on a real high you know and you see um yeah. a side of rob that you haven't seen before you you have that perfect mix of of soulful. I, I've seen some people describe Lufthouse as like soulful electronic music, right? Yeah. So you have this emotive element, the uplift, but then you have also the the fun and the and the, and the dancing and the that experience too. So I think we want to work towards getting um you know a, a run of shows that we can collaborate with the venue with closely, plan really well, mm -hmm. have a lot of fun, and give um people that don't know Rob, you know blown away by seeing something on this scale before yeah. yeah two worlds the instrumentation and and the soulful vocals and then having some hardcore rob fans blown away because it's like you guys are going to obviously continue seeing the tour mm. support new albums support shows but we want to give you something like an experience that you could you're not going to get there right yeah, yeah absolutely something that's really new something that's really yeah. fresh and yeah. i think that will also scratch an itch for, for, for a, a huge amount of the fan base too, but also introduce him to a new generation of people yes. mm -hmm. um, who aren't as, you know, familiar, but then can enter as a fan via the, the Lufthouse portal, you know? Yeah. And I think people really warm to that. I think what we like seeing is when Rob is part of the experience. Yes, he'll always be the kind of front man and entertainer, but actually, like you said earlier on, the the... the the profile is different. The pressure is different. I think when he's when he's in the moment, enjoying himself, we know we've 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 known him for such a long time now. We can you know we can see we can feel it. And I think you know we, you see that when he's up, when he's up on stage with you, you know when we've seen the recordings, you know he's in a different place. And I think that yeah. that's that's cool. That's very different, Robbie, to the Robbie that we see you know leading his his shows. So. That's cool. Yeah. Have you got a favorite Robbie song? So it can be anything overall, overall mm. and it doesn't have to be one you've written. I mean, Flynn and I were both Robbie, like we were fans, like we said, like we, we lined up for the Close Encounters tour. Um, we like good music, think, we like good music. I'm trying to think what I got a top three, okay? Ah, okay. In no particular order, right? Um, and they're all really, really, they're all really well-known songs. Trippin', 
I love because it's very unconventional. Like mm-hmm. yeah. the sonics of it are very unconventional. The verse, yeah. it's like it, it's this very like um, strange thing sonically. And then the chorus just opens up with all these BVs and him singing that very sweet falsetto. So I really like tripping. I think it's very sophisticated pop music. Um, I like Love Light. Love Light's one of my. Yeah. I think that's yeah. a very, very cool, cool track. Um, Flynn, you go, we'll go back and forth. I love, so. I love kids. I think. Yeah, I was going to say this. Kids, <laughs> kids is. And the production as well. It's yeah. It, the hit, the, how hard that song hits, mm-hmm. recorded. Oh, and then live is insane. And the lyrics on it are next level, like the lyrical, the lyrical tapestry of it. And it's kind of like the, it's it's that song and then that lyrical tapestry of Let Me Entertain You, the verses, like they're, they're very unconventional yeah. lyrics. They're very academic almost. Um, the references, especially in Let Me Entertain You, like yeah, talking it. about effigy and stuff. Like the, these, are, these, are, these are vocabularily... Like and then I think Rob says like notify your next of kin like these yeah. are li- like these are things that are very sophisticated lyrically right so they really 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 get me and feel obviously I think feel is just a must one of the greatest songs ever written yeah. feels like the the best track yeah. a deep cut I really liked was from the swing album um I will talk and Hollywood will listen oh yeah mm. that yeah. was like really a really cool song um. Yeah, I feel like feel is like the that's like it, isn't it? Yeah. Couldn't really top that song ballad. Well, Tim and Flynn, thank you for joining <laughs> us on the show. Thanks for having us. Visions Volume One is out now with three new songs that you might not have heard before. It's on all platforms. So go and uh, go and take a listen to it. And it sounds as though the Lufthouse journey has only just started by what we've heard today. So looking forward to see what you guys have coming next. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, guys. Thanks. Pleasure. See you soon, hopefully. Robbie Williams Rewind.